So like I said, I'm Brian, Brian Wasitis. Um, I am a co-founder at Aspect Law Group. We work specifically with the creative community. So it's a lot of people in the indie game scene around here, and artists and designers, uh, some musicians and things like that. Um, yeah, so this is specifically what we do. We do a lot of intellectual property and a lot of business-related stuff, so it's a lot of contracts and negotiations and things like that. Um, Corey, help me. Yeah. It's two screens. Here. This is the computer. <laughs> How does this work? I think now you're good. You're good. Cool. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, got a few topics we'll cover. Um, this is kind of a limited thing since I only have like an hour total to go over everything, including questions. So, each one of these I could probably spend an hour on. Um, if you can't see it in the back, can, anybody, can everybody see it? Can I get like hands back there? Are we good? Okay, if you can't see it, just get closer, I guess. Um, so yeah, we're gonna cover a few things, and then also feel free to ask questions while I'm going through it. So if anything uh, is like relevant, you wanna talk about it right then and not forget about it, feel free to either just like chime in, or if raising your hands your thing, then do that, and I'll call on you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just gonna be like kind of open, and if you wanna hold off questions for things that aren't as related, feel free to do that afterwards too, because we're gonna have time to go over stuff later. Okay, so first we're gonna do like a quick intro to copyright law. Um, so often people don't really know what that is and what it means like in relation to trademark and things like that. But um, so copyright, it is something that you get, it's a bundle of rights um, that you get for creative works that are fixed. Uh, what that means is that you have to put it down somewhere either like on paper or write it down as a code or take a picture of it or make a video, anything that's like a tangible thing and so that you can reproduce it afterwards. Um, it happens automatically, so as soon as you make something and fix it, as they call it, then you automatically get copyright protection on that thing. Uh, and it's also exclusive to you, so when you make it, it vests with you as the author, so you get copyright protection on that. Um, it is a bundle of rights, like I said, so that allows you to make reproductions, so that's the copies, um, to distribute it, so actually send those copies out, either to publishers, whatever. Um, to then, yeah, display, so you can just put it up, put it up on the internet, whatever, those are all individual rights that you get. Um, to prepare derivative works, that's like things that are based on the original work, so if you made like a part two to something, or if you made a spin-off, those are all derivative works that are part of those rights. Um, and the last one's to perform, and that's more like, it's less related with games, but it's still kind of out there and doing things, especially with like music, be playing uh, the actual music itself. And so each of those are rights that are individual, so you get them as a bundle, but they're individual things, so you can exploit one of them, you can make copies but not make distributions or whatever, um, or vice versa. And so they're all, it's all intellectual property as they call it, so it's um, technically supposed to be like physical property, so you can either license it or transfer it, you can assign it off if you want, and each of those are individual, so you could <coughs> license out rights to, I don't know, let's say, make copies to somebody, but not license out the rights to do anything else with it. Um, those are all things that you would work out individually, and uh, also you can assign those to an assignment. means just like an outright sale. So you could sell parts of your rights, but not all of your rights, or if you want to sell everything, you totally can. Um, so like I said, it happens automatically, and that's awesome, but there are benefits to registration, so you don't have to register a copyright to get the protections that come with it. But um, one of the big benefits of registering the copyright is what's called statutory damages. And essentially what that means is that you get at least a base minimum of money if someone were to steal your stuff and copy it. Uh, whereas normally if you don't register, you just get called actual damages, and that's like how much would it have cost to license the work to begin with. Um, so if you're not making a ton of money and someone steals like your music, your actual damages are going to be close to zero dollars, um, unless you can kind of show what the value is there. Um, otherwise, if you register, own registration, it's 35 bucks, so it's super cheap and really worth it because then uh, your statutory damages start at $750 per infringement. So that's it, that's a quick and dirty on copyright. <laughs> All right, so uh, now that we have that out of the way, I'm gonna go on to um, Game Jams, kind of the most relevant stuff in collaboration, just because this town is such a collaborative town. Um, it's awesome that it is, but there's a lot of issues that come along with that. So. Game jams, you're working with a team, right, or collaboration, just doing it for fun. Um, if you're working for somebody, the two biggest things to watch out for is what's called joint authorship, and then also possible partnerships as well. And the joint authorship has to do with copyright. 
So we're going to talk about that. Um, joint authorship in a copyright setting means essentially that if two or more people make a work together, it doesn't matter how much they put towards it, as long as they intend it to be a single work at the end of it, then you are all co-authors of the entire thing and co-owners of the entire thing. So let's say, for instance, you are making a game and you hire somebody to just make some art for you, even if it's just like 5% of the entire game, they are now a 50% owner with you on the whole thing. Um, so it's a really big deal and it comes up all the time. Um, so yeah, you have equal ownership and then one of the big issues with that one too, so if you're an equal owner, then if you go out and exploit the game and you start selling it or whatever, the money has to be split evenly amongst all joint authors. And so it doesn't matter at all if they barely help you or anything, they now will get the exact same amount of royalties as you will get. Um, and another big issue with that is that if you go on to get into like publishing agreements or someone wants to buy the IP from you, um, you'll be making promises usually that say that you either own all of the IP and are able to give it up or have the rights to be able to give them um, the exclusive rights to do things. So you can't promise that if someone else is a co-author because then as a co-author they can exploit it in any way too and they don't need your permission to do that. So, so you could go off and like license it to somebody and tell them that that's exclusive but if you're co-author I mean, they can go out and license it as well so it's actually not exclusive. Um, and so the way that you get around that is you can manage it with contracts. Um, but there's a couple ways. So you could do either, you could just avoid it completely with getting like a contractor agreement in place that says that what work that they make for you is going to be owned by you. Or if it's kind of past tense and it's already happened, you could reach out and get an assignment of those rights back to you instead. Um, and usually that's fine for most part. I mean, I would do it sooner than later until someone, you know, if you're like in a position where you're going to make a lot of money, uh, your bargaining power is much worse because now your co-author is going to want that money, most likely. Uh, so do it before you're rich. And then, uh, yeah, otherwise, if you do intend to have co-authorship, which is fine as well, but I would just recommend kind of setting up what those terms are to begin with. So how much royalties are you going to be receiving? It's not going to be 50-50. Um, you know, what rights do they have as a co-author? Can they go out and exploit it in different ways? All right, so the second one that comes up too along the same lines is partnerships. And this is more from a business standpoint. So when you go out and you intend to do business with somebody, regardless if you have an agreement in place or anything like that, you are technically now a partner with that person in the business. So you don't have to go out and get an LLC or get a corporation or something like that. You don't have to have a partnership agreement. You just are now in business with somebody. Um, and the issues with that, there are many. But kind of the bigger ones, again, it's like ownership. Who's going to own the property at the end of it? Um, if it is a partnership, then it's likely going to be joint, jointly owned. Um, one of the big issues, too, about a partnership, so if you don't have an LLC or corporation, which I'll talk about later, uh, is personal liability. So what that means, it's personal and joint liability. Um, that means if you don't have a business structure in place, then you individually and your assets individually, like your bank account and stuff that you own, is going to be on the hook if you get sued. Uh, and not only that, but since it's jointly, that your assets are also on the hook if your business partner gets sued because you are both liable for all of the business. Um, most of the time that's not going to happen unless you're taking out big debts or something like that, but if you were to make a game and you went out and someone sued you for copyright infringement, uh, your personal assets are going to be on the hook for that. So that's a huge bummer. <laughs> and, um, the other one too is joint authority. So if you're in partnerships uh, as well, that either of you can go out and um, contract on behalf of the business, and you don't need the uh, you don't need the other person's thumbs up to go do that. You can just go do it on your own. And so you're putting yourself out there for sure if with those risks. Um, what you can do to manage that is you can manage it through either contracts, like I said, to get agreements in place that say what happens uh, and why, or you can form an actual business entity. Yeah, so the informal businesses, it just happens once you start going out and like making money at all or even providing goods to people and stuff like that. You're instantly in business from a legal standpoint. Uh, if you're on your own, you're a sole proprietor. If you have other people with you, you're in a partnership. So what you do then to become a more formal entity, um, which goes to like a registration process through the Secretary of State, 
is you can either start up a limited liability company um, or a corporation, and they both have their own benefits to them, and people choose them for different reasons. Um, but the benefits that they both have are that it limits your personal liability. So if, like I said earlier, if you got sued for copyright infringement or something like that, only your business assets are gonna be on the hook, and hopefully you have insurance too, because that's way better. Um, so you won't personally be liable for anything anymore, whether you do it or your business partner does it. Um, both of these structures are also good just for ownership, because then everything will be owned by the LLC or the corporation itself instead of you individually, which is really nice. Um, that helps out if you, at some point in time, need to sell assets out. So let's say someone wants to just like purchase a game from you. Um, all of those IP rights are going to be within the LLC themselves, and so it's a lot cleaner of a transaction than being like, I'm selling it, but I gotta get the rights from someone else, and I have to get the rights from someone else. Um, and then you can take on investors too, that's kind of unusual in this sphere, but it is something you can do with either of them. Um, and then one of the biggest parts too is it clearly sets up expectations and roles. And so, um, you know, it's like, wh what role are you gonna have? As, are you gonna be the president? Or are you gonna be taking on um, all the clients, whatever else? You can set up all the money payouts. Um, a lot of options. And it also gives you a chance to kind of just discuss ahead of time what's gonna be happening in the business itself. So the breakdown of the two of them, this is just, I mean, a really, really basic breakdown. So we have corporations. Um, these are great for having passive investors, which means like if you wanna get investments from people, it's a lot easier just to kick out shares to those people um, and have them be investors in the business. There are more formal requirements that come along with that though, so you have to have a board of directors um, and officers that go along with that. Usually there are requirements for having annual meetings um, and keeping meeting minutes. LLCs do not have those requirements. LLCs are much, much more flexible. You can pretty much do whatever you want with them um, within reason. Um, but yeah, you don't have formal requirements like a board of directors or meeting minutes and things like that, although keeping good accounting is always a good idea. Um, but yeah, then you can also have passive investors as well in an LLC, but it's it's a lot more complicated. It comes into different uh, purchasing agreements. So if you're looking to get investors, often it's just a better idea to be a corporation. Or in Oregon, which is really nice, you can do what's called a, a conversion. It's a statutory conversion, so you can just file a piece of paper and it turns your LLC into a corporation, or the other way around. Um, so it's a nice option. So not all states have that, by the way. So do choose wisely where you set up your businesses. All right, so on to contracts. Um, someone wanted me to talk about contracts. I've given like two hour long lectures on just contracts alone, but uh, we will do just like a really, really basic thing on contracts. So a contract is actually just any agreement between parties. It can be oral, which means like you've talked about it. It can be via like email threads if you've agreed to a thread. Um, uh, so that would be like a written agreement too, or you can have like a really formal agreement, like a formal contract. Um, I tend to think that written contracts are better. I can put that here, so they're great, so please use formal written contracts. Um, they don't have to be crazy and like legalese or anything like that, it's just essentially like a piece of paper or a digital document that kind of lays out what's going on, um, and then you have the party sign off on it. So. One of the biggest benefits there too is just setting out your expectations again and the roles that you'll be doing. Uh, oftentimes people just kind of agree on something that a product will be made or art's gonna be delivered, um, but they don't really set out how that's gonna happen and kind of what oversight there will be, if there's gonna be like revision processes or anything like that, or how does acceptance work. And so it's just having a written contract, even if you just do it yourself, it's just a good way to kind of start those conversations. Um, it also looks more professional, which um, sounds kind of corny, but actually is like a pretty big deal often if you're working with um, people that are in higher situations than you, especially if you're going to be working um, with like Cartoon Network or something like that, uh, but you'll be using their contracts instead. And then one of the last things too that I think people overlook a lot with contracts is it's just something you can go back to and look at later if a dispute comes up. Um, if you have just an email chain or if you've talked it over, it's a lot harder to look back and like see exactly what you meant to do. Um, and so it's just nice to kind of take the heat off yourself and say, it's, well, you know, we agreed on this earlier, here's a piece of paper that says it, so it doesn't really have anything to do with me. Um, here's this piece of paper. And that's also a benefit of attorneys too, because you can just say my attorney made me do it. 
Okay, and then so less generally on contracts as well, um, it's just from a copyright standpoint as well, but so copyright, you can't transfer copyright unless it's in a written agreement. Um, so that's a pretty big deal. Um, because you can't, even if you just have an agreement, they're like, yeah, I'll make this for you and you'll own it. That doesn't count. You have to have this written down. <laughs> Someone likes it. Um, <laughs> You have to have something written down that says how ownership's going to work and who it's transferring to and from. Um, it can be pretty basic, but you do have to have it in writing. The only exception would be a work made for hire, but it's a really specific um, law. I know people use it all the time. It's like, yeah, it's work made for hire, but it's, it's literally like super, super specific about whether you're either an employee or you're working on like maps and stuff like that. Like it's really specific. It's definitely not for everything. Um, and usually an assignment clause is going to be the way to go there instead. Lesson through this. So someone asked about resources around town, and um, there are actually several resources that I really recommend. The Lewis and Clark Small Business Legal Clinic is awesome. They have attorneys there that oversee students at Lewis and Clark Law School, and they will help guide you through a lot of different processes. So uh, whether you want to set up a business like an LLC or something like that, or get contracts made for you, this is a really good route to go. Um, they do have a kind of income requirement and certain other things involved with it too, but if you are kind of working on a low budget, definitely check it out and just see if you can get in. Um, they're really cool. And so with the Oregon Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, um, that's more of a relatively new organization in town, but it is still also really cool and you can go in and get a consultation uh, for a really low price and they can walk you through other issues too. I volunteer my time at both of these clinics, um, so you might see me. And then, actually, it's kind of overlooked, but other attorneys in town are always a good, good uh, resource. I know it kind of seems daunting to like reach out, but for the most part, people like myself um, and a few other firms that are really pointed towards the creative community are in it because uh, we love the community and we love what we do. And so, it's not a burden for us to just, you know, meet up with you for coffee or something like that and talk it through. Or uh, a lot of us don't have um, fees involved with a consultation, so you could come in and check something out just run it by us and we're more than happy to steer you in the right direction uh, than you fumbling around and trying to figure it out yourself or messing up so feel free to reach out to I mean myself or other attorneys in town there's it's a fairly good bunch um, and then other ones like contract generators that comes up kind of frequently I have mixed feelings about them some of them are definitely better than others um, it's just that all contracts they're, they're not one-size-fits-all I mean literally the contracts that we make for clients will be these like kind of master agreements that they can use in separate parts, but every single time it's going to be different. So um, the different uh, payouts, right, or who's going to own what and why, it's, it's different every single time. So unless you know what you're doing um, and what you're getting yourself into, I would steer clear of them or at least read the thing that comes out at the end. Um, that's a good place to start too. Uh, and one of the better ones, I think, um, not legal advice, right, because I'm not going to tell you to go run out and use generators, but Freelancers Union has um, some really good resources, and I've been a fan of them for a while. So do check their stuff out. So here we are, already a fair use. I didn't think we'd have time, but sure enough. Um, fair use. Someone asked about this one in regards to games, about what you can make, and I actually heard uh, someone was playing Pocket and Morty. <laughs> So the question is, when and what can you use to qualify as fair use? Um, it's a tough question, because fair use, by definition, doesn't have any bright lines at all. I can't tell you um, exactly what qualifies for fair use and what doesn't. And it was purposely made that way to be a case-by-case -case basis, uh, to be actually decided by courts. So fair use limits uh, uh, permits limited use of works that otherwise you'd have to get permission from the author. It is an affirmative defense. What that means is that you can't prove fair use until you're in court. And if you're in court, that means you've been sued. So <laughs> it's a really strong balancing act there uh, as to whether or not that's what you want to lean on. I mean, you can't get away with this. A lot of great artists to do it all the time, depending on your use, uh, if you really go for it. Um, you, I, I mean, sometimes I've seen things that I say 100%, I think this is fair use. But if the author, who created the copyright that you've been using doesn't think so, you might be getting a cease and desist letter, or worse, you might just get pulled into a lawsuit. 
So it's a tough call. Um, yeah, some of the most or uh, the most relevant ones, I guess, would be commentary and criticism and parody. You see parody a lot. Um, the courts there. There's been some interesting cases lately about what all is entailed in those things. So what they look at, this is the only really part that they check out for sure, is this four-part test, essentially. And you look at uh, the purposes of the use, so what are you doing with someone else's copyrights, uh, the nature of the original copyrighted work, so the more um, creative it gets, then the more copyright protection it'll have, and so they will weight that more if it's like a really creative work that you're using. The amount that you use, so if you just use a small portion of it or a larger portion of it, um, and that also affects how you use it in yours as well. So uh, there's definitely been fair use cases that came out positively for the person who used fair use, uh, where they used 100% of someone's copyright, so an entire picture or like an entire poem. Uh, but it just really depends on how you're using it and what you're doing with the entire piece at the end of it. And then the effect on the market, which essentially, by you doing this thing, are you hurting the other party? Do they lose out on money? Do they lose out on possible other things? Like maybe they were going to do something similar to you, um, if, make a parody of their own work. So that's another possible issue. And those are all just weighted by the judge. Um, so the alternative, this is what I tend to recommend just because it's from a liability standpoint, it makes way more sense. It's just go get a license. Um, Depending on who it is, if it's a small artist, you will almost always be able to get a good license. Just reach out, uh, like Twitter even, or something like that, and ask them if it's okay to use this work. Um, and like I said earlier, contracts can be whatever you want. So if you get a tweet back that says, yeah, go for it, cool. You now have a license to do use that work. Um, if it is a larger group, oftentimes they will have like an in-house licensing department. So Marvel has their own in-house licensing. I know uh, Disney and Lucas as well have their um, licensing departments. And you can reach out and give it a shot and see what happens. You won't always hear back, that's for sure. Um, but it's still better than just going for because Something like Lucas Films um, and Disney, for sure, are notorious for going after any sort of use on their copyrights, even if it's fair use. So it's a tough call. Um, and it used to be that you could look at some things and say, yeah, all right, this is uh, a parody because it talks about the original work. And that was kind of the line for a while. But then there's been some court cases recently that are talking about how it really doesn't have to be about the original work anymore. It's just how much you use it. And so these are all different courts coming up with their own ideas about where we are currently. Uh, so it's a hot mess. I would avoid it if you can. Um, that's all I got. That was my 30-minute presentation. For questions. I saw this one up first. And I'll go, yeah. Are there um, are there any major cases involving a video game of fair use that you can recall coming up recently? Um, it's pretty rare that you see it in video games. Almost everything is licensed by uh, the main publisher. So, for instance, like anything that's related to Cartoon Network or Adult Swim at all has been already pre-approved by Cartoon Network or Adult Swim. Um, the most relevant things are just like the Let's Play YouTube videos where people are commenting on going through a game and uh, just giving their opinions about it, how they feel about it. That's, you see that a lot. But as far as um, someone making a game based off of either someone else's, or just someone else's work in general, it's pretty, it's pretty rare that that goes to court. And so that's a problem with fair use as well. It's like we'll have legal scholars that kind of talk about what they think, where it should go. But really the only decisions that we get are from courts. And, so that means someone has had the time to pay to go all the way through it and get a decision. Um, so it's pretty rare. Uh, could you talk more about work for hire and assignment clauses? Uh-huh, yeah, sure. So you see often in, uh, in contracts, I'm sure everybody's seen it, it's like this is a work made for hire, um, so everything you make is owned by us. But if it's not a work made for hire, then you are assigning the rights to us. Um, you don't really need the first part, because like I said, so work made for hire, so it's either you're an employee and then so your employer is going to own everything. Or there's like a list of 10 very, very specific things that have to do with work made for hires. And I'm almost positive ones like you're helping make a map. Um, another one's something about a collection of like video works and stuff like that. Um, so those really don't help you ever. 
the better way to do it is just go from an assignment route. And so an assignment would just say that you out, like if you're hiring somebody, you just have them assign all their rights to you. Um, that takes care of everything that you would otherwise need to do. Um, and you kind of bypass works pay for hire anyway. Works pay for hire is kind of a fallback to where if you forgot that to do these things, if you forgot to do like an assignment that now you possibly have this other way to get the work. Does that make sense? Is that? Um, an assignment is, that's like a one sentence, one to two sentence thing. I'm just saying like, you own all the copyright for everything. Yeah, it'd be like all right title and interest in the thing, you'll own that, yeah. And so you'll see if you do if you like search assignment clauses, they all look the exact same, and that's all you need to do. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, the low low cost, high reward, so to speak, for the getting your thing copyright registered. Mm -hmm. What about trademarks, like the game titles and stuff like that? Yeah, trademarks. Um, they have a higher entry fee. So per class of goods and services, trademarks can always go back to um, your use in relation to either the services or the goods. Um, in a game context, it would be the game itself would be a good, or you could do like development services if you wanted to register your game dev studio. Um, they start at 225 per class of goods and services. And so if you want to do like game software and something else that's not really related to game software, that's going to be two filing fees essentially. Um, so it'd be 550, right? Or 500? No, I'm messing that up. It's real bad. It's 450. I absolutely recommend getting a copyright, you know, registered no matter what you're doing. You're going commercial with something, but if you're gonna like, you know, get something on Steam through Greenlight, mm -hmm. you, you absolutely recommend getting a trademark before. It is a conversation you have to have about economics and um, the foreseeable future. I mean, if there's something that you really, really care about, and you don't care if it's gonna make zero money. Um, Someone else but, has to care. <laughs> say it again? Sorry. And someone else has to care enough to take it? <laughs> or try yeah, to. I guess. I mean, if you care about a project, you should lock down everything that you possibly can. Um, own that outright, and then, I mean, that gives you all the protections that you would need. But it's, but it's not 100% necessary. It's not 100% necessary. When you start using a trademark to begin with, you start gaining what's called common law rights, and so that's protection in the places that you use. Um, so if you start selling out to different like states, then you'll start getting protection in those states. Uh, I'll come to you afterwards, unless it's like relevant right now. Okay, so you can have to have your hand up. Um, it kind of depends. I mean, if you have the money to put down 225 plus attorney's fees if you go that route, uh, I highly recommend it for many reasons. One of the problems with trademarks is that if you don't register, then someone else starts using the same name and registers before you, um, you can end up in a bad situation where you have to go in and cancel their registration and then figure out concurrent use issues, which essentially since they started using at the same time or a related time, they get protection also, while you also get protection. Um, and so it can just be, it can be a mess. So the sooner that you can do it, the better, but still it just kind of depends on where you are financially at the time. Um, oftentimes, I would say if you got a registration from an attorney, you're looking at probably upwards to like $1,000 all said and done. Um, and so if that money can be better spent on business development or marketing, right, then that makes more sense, and then hit it when you can, just get the trademark afterwards. And there's usually avenues that you can go about and be okay. Um, if you're not going to register right away, just be vigilant about who else is using it and what's happening at that time. Um, but the trademark process, too, is, is much more cumbersome than copyrights. Copyrights, like, you send it in. Maybe someone looks at it, maybe does it, kind of goes into a black hole, and then you get a registration back. Uh, where trademarks, there's this huge process of examining attorneys. If they find something wrong with their application, you'll get office actions back, which are essentially like legal briefs, and you have to persuade them as to why you should get a registration. So it's a, it's a totally different thing than a copyright registration. Um, I had more of a question about having employees, mm -hmm. and if you've already set up all the other stuff, like you have an LLC and all of that set up, and then you have employees, um, there's maybe potentially a verbal contract, but uh, mm -hmm. is it really important to have the, the written contract down right away? So from an intellectual contract? property standpoint, um, no, as long as they're you know, payroll and you're their employees, then you're good to go as like an owner. But um, employee handbooks, I am a fan of them just because again, it like lays out expectations. And so you know, no one really knows for the most part, like what the laws are around being an employee and things like that. So just as a way to tell them ahead of time, 
you know, what to expect from the whole relationship is definitely a good idea, but it's not technically required. We have one back behind you first, so. Um, as far as trademarks, uh, there was an incident late when with two books with the same title that came hmm. out, and one book came out was a bestseller, and the other book came out was not. They made a lot of money on that second book that came out that was not the bestseller. So, um, again, I'm more interested in if you have seen something like this in your work with digital media and video game media, and if you have any precedents to, that I would love <coughs> to see about title conflictions or any like major cases titles that you get to read about concurrent. Generally, um, titles aren't registrable normally mm -hmm. for books. They just they aren't unless you're in a series, and then you can register. Um, same goes for movie titles. Um, games are different because it's more of an interactive thing, so they've allowed game titles to be registered. Um, yeah, it's strange. Is, it, is this related? Yeah. Uh, I thought like a while ago there was something with the game Mirror's Edge, and people were flipping out about like there's another game either a long time ago. There's a guy in the gaming industry who's like the patent troll. <laughs> where he had like trademarked a bunch of stuff for other companies. I don't know, just look at that. If you're Mirror's looking for, Edge? Yeah, a similar case of some sure you Google Mirror's Edge and trademarking, it'll come up. And actually, I saw something on TV actually about that exact issue. Uh, it's a guy who owns the trademark to the word Edge. Yeah. Mm. And so That's anything that has Edge, Edge, he's trying to do what Kings did with the mm -hmm. word Saga. And so anything that had the word Saga King was attacking them before. <laughs> and so, you know, they, he got shot down in courts, of course, a lot. But. So Go on, I guess I. Fine. <laughs> uh, so just one question related to that, real fast, was um, you know, like when discussing damages and stuff, whether it be with copyright or even if you're like trying to prove yourself in court, are attorney's fees recoupable if? You know, you have to battle an entity basically proving yourself to say, like... They can be. Okay. So as a part of registration for copyrights, it is a part of that, mm -hmm. um, but it's not guaranteed that you'll get them. Okay. It kind of depends on how terrible the people have been to you and yeah. whether or not the judge like, wants to. You. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then my other question is, like, what is your advice for, say, like, um, you know, a budding studio or developers where, like, you know, a lot of people are using public tools, whether it's mm -hmm. Dropbox or GitHub and that sort of thing. Um, and it may not be a situation where, like, for the copyright, where the work's already fixed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's work in progress. You see lots of games at festivals and stuff, you know, starting to gain momentum. They haven't been sold. They're not maybe, you know, feature complete yet. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest are the best ways to protect yourself in those situations? So that all still counts for copyright. Okay. Um, incomplete stuff, I mean, if you've made something, it doesn't have to be the final product. Right. That counts. Um, okay. And you can register unpublished works, too. Okay. So it doesn't have to be out and available to the public yet. Um, no one except for you right. have seen it, right? Still fine. Right. Um, so, I mean, one way that you could go about it is before you let people see it, is go register the copyright in it. Yeah. Um, that's a plus. I mean, that's kind well, of the, the best like thing it's to do. To err on the side of caution, but if you did end up in a situation where maybe you had it at first, mm -hmm. you know, what would be kind of like the path to take as far as like proving that you know you were one of the original uh, owners of that work or you know that trying to show maybe someone else had taken that idea whether you showed that best or whatever mm -hmm. and then run with it afterwards. Man, I, just, I mean looking at dates to see who came first. Uh, one of the issues with copyright so too is that independent creation doesn't count as copyright infringement. Okay. So if two people, I mean theoretically if two people make the same thing that that's fine. That's you both okay. get copyright protection. Uh, in practice, that is crazy hard to prove. Yeah. Um, one of the parts of copyright is just proving, you have to prove access to your copyright to begin with, yeah. to be able to go after somebody, um, which oftentimes it's like, have you been to a conference before? It's like, yes. Yeah. I was oh. there. Done. Okay. Access. You know, like. <laughs> Wait, so going back to what you said uh -huh. with like just one on one situation uh -huh. is. If one had originated from a group, do they have like somehow a stronger argument in that case? 
Like, yeah, I mean, if you if you start in a group, this is what I think you're going with, right? So if you start in a group setting, is that correct? And or like leaves, an LLC or, or something, uh -huh. right? And if they were the ones that, say, ran off with an idea or something like that, you as a sole person had a more uphill battle to fight in that case or no? So if you, what, can you run by the situation? Like, uh, yeah. let's say I'm a, I'm a single person working on a game, which you said, you know, doesn't necessarily qualify in that case for being copyrighted, correct? No, you're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. I guess I missed a part where it went to the one-on-one -on -one situation, like if mm -hmm. two people had, you're saying if they had originated the idea, they had never known each other, or? So if, if people, so you're talking about independent creation? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they can't know each other or have seen okay. each other's work. Okay has to be like purely independent, and then it'll be individual copyrights. I misinterpreted yeah. independent yeah. as a sole person vice. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Into yeah. completely different no. space yeah. times or whatever. <laughs> yeah, as an individual, you're, you're totally fine with copyrights. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are LLCs only statewide or federal? Is there different? Yeah, so all business entities, corporations, and LLCs are state entities. Um, from a tax standpoint, that's all federal stuff, and they don't really care what state you're from as long as you're like are one of those entities. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you are setting up an LLC, you're setting up an Oregon like LLC, or you can set up wherever you want. Uh, I tend to think that setting them up where you live makes more sense unless you have some really compelling reason to have to pay taxes in different states and things like that. So. What's also sorry the benefit of like a business ID number or bin? So a bin is something that you need to get if you need employees and things like that. Usually the process is you would start an LLC, um, you would get a registration number for that, then you would get a tax identification number, usually it's an EIN, and that's for the federal stuff, all the federal taxes. And those are really the only two parts you need. If you're working in Portland, then you should also register with the city of Portland for their business tax. Um, and then bins are when you start getting employees and some other specific payroll stuff. Saw something over here. There. So you said that contracts are very unique in each individual situation. Mm -hmm. Do you have kind of a list of parameters or key elements that you generally look for in a contract, or that would be important to have in a contract? Oh man, there's tons. Um, so the main part that most people are going to look at is what's called the scope of work, and so that's really what is going to be delivered during the contract, and so that's. Um, you know, what are you creating? What's the timeline that you're creating it under? Is there a corresponding payment timeline to that? Um, what's the process for revisions? If you don't really talk about revisions, then it's possible that it's unlimited revisions until they are accepted. Um, yeah, then it's kind of like, how do you get out of it? What are termination clauses are a really big deal. Um, oftentimes, if someone's hiring you, they'll have awesome termination clauses, and you'll have none. So they're essentially like looped in until they're satisfied with everything. Um, yeah, what happens if you don't get paid on time? Suspension of performance, I'm a big fan of. Um, that can just be like, you haven't paid me or you haven't delivered something in time. That, no, what, what, am I good? Oh. Yeah, you have like you got a little bit. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you don't get paid, can you stop performing until you get paid? Uh, those are big. <laughs> Assignments of rights, right? So who's going to own what at the end of it? Um, often I've seen assignments clauses that are like insane when they weren't supposed to be that way. Always read your contracts because, I mean, way over 50% of the time, the conversation that people are having is totally different than the contract they end up receiving. Uh, I'm, I'm serious, especially if you're working with like a bigger company that's hiring you. They have to go through probably like 10 different people until they uh, get you a contract. And so I can guarantee you that no one's read that thing yet. Um, so your first draft's gonna be like terrible. So make sure you read that thing. And, yeah. So if you are participating in a game jam that mm -hmm. has a specific theme that the event organizer like says off the bat, like I wanna use this theme, mm -hmm. and the group makes a game off of that that actually seems like it could be pretty successful and they go on to try to make it uh, money-making project does the event organizer get part of that copyright since it was part of their theme yeah huh, interesting um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're gonna be rich will <laughs> um, first I would check the terms of the game jam to begin with so if it's a bigger kind of like 
uh, nation or worldwide event, they will also they'll often have terms of service linked in on the ticketing. And that, I mean, yeah, they could be the owners of it or maybe they'll be licensees or something like that. Um, but if that's not a part of it and it's just like people meet up for a, a casual jam and there's a theme to it, um, just ideas aren't copyrightable to begin with. And so you are, should be fine just working off that. If it gets like really specific about the theme, then there's an argument that it's you know, a joint authorship, possibly. Um, but if it's just like a basic theme, then that's not really a protectable thing to begin with. Yeah. You've gone already, so I gotta ask <laughs> you. Uh, about like clones, say you make a simple game, and mm -hmm. someone clones it, like patch up, patch app, and it's like notorious for doing that. Mm -hmm. Even though like, they never worked on you for it, Ah oh, man, market a ton and just tell everybody that you're better. Um, so clones, if the internet didn't hear. Um, one of the big issues with clones is that copyright doesn't protect like basic ideas and basic uh, game mechanics either. And so it's going to be really specific about the artwork, um, about the characters that are involved and what they look like, music and things like that. But um, like the Flappy Bird thing, there was just a million clones because the actual game itself was so simple um, that all you have to do is like reskin it. I mean, you just have to change the program a little bit too because that's also protected. Um, but you, the more complicated your game gets, the better argument that you're going to have that there's copyright infringement. But if it's really basic, then the basic elements probably are not going to be protectable to begin with. Is that good? Way back there. Um, going off that question, then, can you talk about uh, Copyright and code. Uh huh. Yeah. So, same principle, I guess. Um, we haven't talked about functionality, though. So, in copyright, another thing that's not protected are things that are functional in nature, um, and that's supposed to be covered by patents. So, that'll kind of be just like basic programming tools that everybody uses, like what's common knowledge. Um, but the software, at a bare minimum, you'll get a protection on how you've compiled the software. So, the way that it's laid out is going to be protected. So if someone just straight up copies and pastes, you will be able to have some claim against them, even if what you've written isn't individually copyright protectable. Um, but then the more complicated the code gets, then you have a better argument for that too. Is that good? All right, now you can <laughs> Yeah, if you want it to be owned by the LLC itself. So technically, LLCs and corporations are separate legal entities. Um, so they exist outside of you. So if you have something that you made before the LLC was started and you want it to be owned by the LLC, you'll need to write an assignment to have that you know, sent to the LLC instead or licensed from you or bought in any way. You know. But otherwise, yeah, it's going to be individual yours. Two cents. Huh? I said two cents. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Counts. A high five. Where are you supposed to keep all this really important documentation? With your attorney. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it doesn't matter. You just keep Google Drive's fine, whatever. Just a place that's not going like, to disappear. That's a good place not to put it. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, internet folders is fine. As long as you remember your password, I guess, it's good to go. So, yeah, but it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I would just try not to keep anything in just physical format only. So make sure you scan your documents if it's only a paper format. Keep copies of them. I think I saw something else over here, right? Is everybody happy now? Satisfied crowd? Cool. Well, it's uh, been a pleasure. Um, if, you, if you have questions afterwards and it just comes to you, you're like, damn it. Uh, we have, I have some little cards up here that you can take if you want. And feel free to get in touch about anything. Uh, here to help. So thanks again.